Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to our launch event for the new SBRN healthcare competition. Apologies about the delay this morning. Um, so competition 20 will cover the challenges in autism and learning disability, as well as health inequality in maternity care. We're very excited to launch this competition and we've worked in partnership with the HSN network in the de development of the challenge briefs, uh, but also in partnership with Autistica for the Autism and Learning Disabilities um, Challenge. So I'm Fanny Burroughs, I'm, I'm leading on the SBRI Healthcare Programme and I'm joined today by other members of the SBRI Healthcare uh, Programme Management Office supporting the competition, as well as our Programme Director, Professor Mark Lewis. Um, and we also have some great speakers um, today to give you some insight on the competition and the specific um, challenges that uh, we're looking to address today. So for the agenda, we'll start with an introduction about the SBRI Healthcare Programme uh, with an overview of this particular competition. We'll then be joined by different speakers. We've got uh, Dr. Girish Vaidia, a, a consultant child and adolescent psychiatrist. Uh, we also have the team from Autistica, Dr. Amanda Roystorff, uh, Dr. James Kusak, and Dr. Ned Redmore. Um, so Amanda is head of research, James is, is the CEO, uh, and Ned is research and partnerships manager of, the, of Autistica. Um, and we'll also have, uh, finally, we'll, we'll welcome Kelly Harvey, a, a neonatal senior lead nurse, to discuss the, the maternity care challenge. So we'll have an opportunity to ask questions to, to our speakers during the session through the Q&A box. Uh, and we'll answer some of your questions live as well during this session. Um, we'll also hear from Helen uh, Hoyland from the Yorkshire and Humber AHSN and Charlotte Burroughs from Southwest AHSN. Um, they will take us through the AHSN network um, and their role in supporting innovation um, and in particular a program of work on health equity in, in the perinatal pathway. Um, and finally, we'll have Randa from the SBR Healthcare Program Management Office that will come back and take us through the competition assessment process and how to apply to this competition. Um, and we'll finish with a final um, question and answer session at the end um, in relation to the program, the application process, or any question you have for DHSN. So if we could move on to the next slide, please. Um, very quick housekeeping note. Um, any questions, please put them into the Q&A box and we'll answer to them either in writing or live during the Q&A sessions. Uh, we'll upload the slides and the recording of this session today on our website, so you'll be able to access it in the next few days. You can also find a lot of information on our website. Um, you can find the challenge briefs with information about the competition and, and the particular ch challenges that we're looking to address, uh, and other, any guidance around the um, application process. So now, without any further delays, I'd like to move on to our first speaker, and I'd like to introduce you to Randa Tashdin. Um, Brenda is the Senior Program Manager in the Innovations Team in the SBRI Healthcare Program Management Office. She will give you some information about the, the program um, and the scope of our competition today. So over to you, Brenda. Thank you, Fanny, and good morning, everyone. Um, as Fanny mentioned, I'll just briefly introduce um, the SBRI Healthcare Program, um, who we are, what we do, um, and just introduce the competition um, that we're delivering this year. Um, so next slide, please. Um, so the SBRI Healthcare Program is funded by NHS England and NHS Improvement, um, is managed by LGC and is supported by the Academic Health Science Network. And the aim of the program is to bring together business and government partners to address unmet needs within the NHS and facilitate the introduction of innovations into the NHS. And it does so through the power of government procurement to accelerate technology development and support innovations through stages of development, which are typically hard to fund. And so the key objectives of the program are to improve healthcare, increase NHS efficiencies, allow the NHS to get access to new technologies and to support economic growth in the country. Next slide, please. And as mentioned, we work closely with the Academic Health Science Network and there are 15 AHSNs across England um, that were established by NHS England to spread innovation and improve health and economic growth. So they're very much aligned um, with the 
what we do at Espira Healthcare. And each HSN works across a distinct geography, um, serving different populations in each region. And we have um, a couple of people with us today, um, Helen and Charles from the, S from the AHSN, um, who will talk more about what they do later on. Um, so I'll leave it to them uh, to cover that bit later. Next slide, please. The SBI Healthcare Program um, offers an excellent opportunity for um, businesses, um, especially early stage companies, to develop and demonstrate their innovative technologies. And the key highlights of the program is that it provides an early source of funding for companies, and it's a risk-oriented program. So it really allows companies and organizations to get up off of their feet and de-risk their projects, making them more attractive for follow-on investment opportunities. And the program has a simple application process with a quick turnaround to allow organizations to get better accessibility to funding. And also um, the program has links to many supportive networks, including the HSN to support companies with the advancement and development of their innovations. So overall, the program is quite attractive um, to SMEs. And in terms of the key features of the program, the program runs yearly themed competitions designed around unmet needs within the NHS. So it aims to address relevant and demanding clinical challenges. And although it's primarily aimed at SMEs, any size business is eligible to apply, including NHS organizations and higher education institutions, as long as a route to market has been uh, demonstrated and as long as they're based in Europe. And the way that the program has been set up is that it um, covers the entire translational development pathway from early feasibility all the way up to implementation and adoption. And that includes phase one awards, which concentrate on research and development that'll prove the scientific, technical, and commercial feasibility of the project. And those are worth up to £100,000 and last for six months. And if successful at phase one, projects can then move on to more detailed product development at phase two, which um, are worth up to £800,000 and last for a year. Next slide, please. Um, other key features is that, as mentioned, the program acts on a pre-commercial procurement model, which again is all about getting technologies to a place where they can be procured by the NHS. So projects are 100% funded, unlike many other grant schemes, and the IP rests with the supplier with only certain usage rights with the public sector. Um, we also take a light touch monitoring approach so that um, the administrative tasks of funding isn't burdensome and projects are monitored based on a milestone driven approach rather than hours worked or costs incurred. And as a result of these um, features, the program has been quite successful um, over the years. Next slide, please. So to date, we've supported over 229 technologies and invested over 100 million pounds in those technologies. Next slide, please. And um, from that portfolio, we've seen over 70 companies generate commercial revenue, 60 of which had sales within the NHS and over 300 million pounds of private investment leveraged. Next slide, please. And this portfolio includes a range of different technologies, including devices, digital health, diagnostics, and even services. And just to give you an example, um, we supported Open Bionics um, with the development of Hero Arm, the world's first clinically approved 3D printed bionic arm. And following their SBRI funding, um, they raised 4.6 million pounds in Series A funding and carried out a world first clinical trial, which led to their product being launched in private clinics across the UK, US and France. Next slide, please. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, the SBI Healthcare Program um, runs themed competitions to address identified unmet needs within the NHS. And one of the themes for our competition this year is autism and learning disabilities. And 
the reason why we've chosen um, this topic area as um, one of the competition challenges is living with autism and a learning disability can be difficult for patients and their families, um, particularly due to significant health inequalities that these communities face, uh, which includes lack of access to sufficient support and care. And tackling these challenges has been flagged as a priority in the NHS long-term plan. Um, and despite attempts to tackle these challenges across a range of settings and services, um, including work done through the transforming care program that the NHS and other government bodies are doing to um, help deliver treatment and care uh, whilst meeting the ambitions set out in the NHS long-term plan, um, still there exist pressures on communities and healthcare systems. Um, and these have continued to grow, um, particularly due to the COVID pandemic. Um, so in light of this, we've partnered with Autistica to deliver this competition and work together to support the development of promising solutions to these challenges um, to help deliver better treatment and care for autistic people and people living with um, learning disabilities. Next, please. So in this competition, we are specifically seeking innovative solutions that will tackle challenges around the early uh, identification and detection of autism and uh, learning disabilities and around the provision of appropriate and relevant support and care equally to patients, their families and carers. And we have a few field experts with us today who will be speaking on the challenges in each of these areas in more detail shortly. Uh, but if you'd like to find out further information about this competition scope, you can access the challenge brief on our website and a link is also provided here and these slides will be made available. And I'm just gonna hand over to Fanny who will just introduce the second challenge of this competition, uh, which is um, health inequalities in maternity care. Thank you, Amanda. And if we could um, off this continent slide. So I'm really pleased to, to introduce this um, standing competition on maternity care. Um, so we know that there's been several initiatives and, and a very clear commitment from, from the NHS and in the long term plan to achieve a reduction in stillbirth um, in maternal mortality and, and also neonatal mortality by 50%, um, but also with a reduction in, in preterm birth. We also know that adverse outcomes of pregnancy disproportionately affect women from, from deprived and ethnic minority groups. So health inequality is and should really be a core focus for the future of maternity care. This competition focuses on improving outcomes and, and overcoming perinatal inequalities um, throughout. In the UK, there's many different factors that are found to affect perinatal outcomes. And we'll hear a little bit more about this later on when Charlotte Burris comes to talk to us about those uh, factors um, found to affect perinatal outcomes. It's pretty clear that targeted and, and tailored interventions are really necessary to engage with different communities and improve outcomes and access. So this competition is focusing on three key areas and they're calling for innovations um, to address these challenges by developing real solutions that are centered around the women their babies and their families. Um, the first one is around perinatal mental health. Uh, mental health conditions are sometimes overlooked um, and they, they often go unrecognized with a lack of services uh, for some women and, and, and particular conditions. Now, what we know is that mental health can very rapidly deteriorate during pregnancy. And, and that's why early identification and interventions are really critical to support women and their families. The clear opportunities to deliver evidence-based perinatal mental health care, and particularly focusing on reducing the disparities between groups of women. So this particular competition is asking for solution, innovative solution, that enables the provision of mental health services and support for, for all women. Um, so the particular focus is, for example, around risk identification tool that enable early and targeted intervention, um, but also including the recognition of predictable factors that are associated with mental health conditions. Um, but also the engagement with vulnerable groups. The provision of care to women and their partners and, and training tools as well for staff and healthcare workers that um, will be then able to identify risk and support women and their families. Or again, evidence-based tools or, or technologies that will support women um, going through trauma or to provide tailored peer-to-peer -peer support. Um, another key 
area of focus in these complications, the support provided to women and their family after being discharged um, to the community. Uh, and these challenges could really be addressed through technological advancement with a communication at the heart of it to prevent hospital readmission, um, reduce interventions and drive better outcomes generally. So, um, so some innovative solutions could be in the form of targeted referral pathway. So um, the women can then find the support they need when they need it, um, but also the provision of comprehensive um, information or targeted peer-to-peer -peer support uh, for women in their communities. Uh, but also some specific tools that would empower uh, women and their families to care for their babies at home. Uh, that includes communication, information, um, and home or community monitoring approaches that will help to prevent escalation. And finally, the challenges continue with identifying women at risk from um, common perinatal conditions. Um, and, and those conditions could affect the pregnancy and the postnatal journey. So if we can identify these risks, as early as possible, whilst we ensure we achieve a wider engagement and support, uh, particularly for those most vulnerable or, or deprived groups, we'd be able to deliver better maternity care and, and derive better outcomes. Um, so improving equity and equality in maternal and neonatal care through enhanced risk identification, uh, the diagnosis of pregnancy risk factors, stratification, and that would be clear, a clear priority. Um, but also alongside that, considering uh, and identifying some social or lifestyle risk factors um, in order to drive an improvement in outcomes. So some solutions for, for these challenges could be um, enabling the early identification of risk factor from the preconception stage through pregnancy and in the period after birth, and together with educational tools for healthcare workers. But also understanding the role of, of AI algorithm, uh, some AI tools, predictive tools to identify risks early or predict them from a combination of factors, including social factors. Technology that support pregnancy and, and, and pre-pregnancy health, but also tools that would enhance the engagement between women and the healthcare professional. And that would be centered around communication, accessibility to information, to engage with the heart to reach groups, um, but also to include women and their partner in the risk assessment. So that gives you a bit of an overview of, of, of the three categories we're looking to address um, in this particular challenge. Um, and again, just as Randa said, you can find a lot more information on our website um, in the challenge brief, and, and you've got the link um, on our slide if you want to have a look later. So if we could now move on to the next slide, and that is a brief overview of, of the sort of competition timeline. Uh, competition 20 um, opened yesterday for application um, and the deadline for application will be on the 6th of July at one o'clock. The assessment will happen um, in the period sort of July to August with a selection panel um, scheduled early September. So the, the, the applicants will be uh, notified of outcomes uh, around that time with a view to start um, the projects and the contract around October time. Um, so that gives you a little bit of an overview of how we plan to run this particular competition. So now moving on to the next slide, please. Um, and we, we would like now to move on to perhaps a, a deeper overview of those challenges that we're looking to address through this competition. And I'm really pleased to invite our guest speakers today to take you through these challenges from a, an expert point of view. So first of all, if we could move on to the next slide, I'd like to introduce you to um, Dr. Girish Vadia. Um, and, and Gary is the clinical lead at, at Yorkshire and Humble Operational Delivery Network for Learning, Disability and Autism. Uh, and he's a consultant child and adolescent psychiatrist. So welcome, Girish. Um, thank you for, for joining the session today. Really appreciate it. And I'm going to hand over to you now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fanny. Uh, can you even see me? Oh, good. Uh, good morning, everyone. I've got a short time, so I'm going to make it uh, short and punchy. Uh, let's talk of what it means to have autism and to have learning disabilities. So can can just we go to the next slide, please? All these slides are going to be available anyway afterwards. So a little bit about me. I've been a consultant, child and adolescent psychiatrist for over 20 years. Makes me feel very, very old now as a result of that. I'm also a medical legal expert witness, which gives me an understanding of the legal position in regards to healthcare and stuff. 
in my past positions, I've been a clinical director, both from a provider point of view, in which uh, I was a clinical director for a provider service. I also worked with a CCG to be able to understand what commissioners have to think of when they are commissioning services. I've been an associate medical director, clinical lead, and I'm currently the clinical lead for the operational delivery network for autism and learning disability. Increasingly, I'm also being asked to provide consultancy to healthcare companies trying to understand uh, the UK uh, healthcare space in a way. Can we have the next slide, please? So let's go to the fundamental question because we understand disability to be visible, but fundamentally what defines a disability or a disorder? If you look at my face, and if I was to say to you that I have got a disability, uh, people would say, well, we can't see it, but in fact, it's right there on my face. It's staring at you. So my disability basically is that I need glasses. Now, if you think of me as a consultant, child and adolescent psychiatrist having to do all the work that I do, yes, glasses are essential. But if I was to be plucked out from England, and if I was a farmer in rural Kenya, for example, just a, a random place I'm thinking of, uh, and if I have got, a, I'm, I'm a shepherd in rural Kenya, looking after my cows, looking after my sheep, looking after my goats, I've got a wife who is also illiterate, I'm illiterate, my lack of eyesight or my difficulty in reading would not pose a problem if I was not in my current room. And the reason I'm saying that is we often understand disability or disorder in a visible sense, but there is a lot more to it than what is seen, i.e. the invisible disability and what arises out of that invisible disability. So if you don't remember Anything out of what I'm going to say next, just remember the next two slides, if you can. Uh, can you please go to the next slide? So we come to that core question of what defines a disorder. And there are three concepts to understand, which would be really helpful when you're trying to understand what we are looking for from a clinical point of view. The first thing is impairment. Impairment is a loss or abnormality of psychological, physiological, or anatomical structure or function. It's the impairment which is associated with loss or abnormality. Can we go to the next slide, please? Yeah, sorry. Uh, from impairment arises disability. So disability is a restriction or lack of ability to perform an activity in the manner or within the range considered normal for a human being. Now, if you, if you think of somebody who has got, uh, who has lost both their legs, and if they are in a wheelchair, and if they are placed in front of steps uh, going into a shop, they have a disability, which they have an impairment. Basically, they have lost both their lower limbs. Out of that arises the disability because unlike those who have got both legs or who can climb those steps, they are now unable to climb those steps. As a result of that, that person has become disabled arising from an impairment. Can we go to the next slide, please? From that impairment and the disability, then arises a handicap. By the way, these are all WHO, World Health Organization terms. So apologies for the wordiness of them. But what is a handicap? A handicap is a disadvantage for a given individual that results from an impairment or disability that limits or prevents the fulfillment of a role that is normal for them. Why is that important? That is important because if you just look at physical disability, which is very obvious, you can imagine, yes, if you, had, if you have lost both your limbs, you have a wheelchair, but the moment you put a ramp instead of a wheelchair, that same person who was disadvantaged from going into a shop with steps can now actually perform the same activity that any other person would. So that ramp acted as a facilitator, which helped that person overcome that disadvantage or the handicap, which essentially means, can we have the next slide, please? 
which essentially means that the disadvantage that disability confers on the individual, the handicap that it confers on the individual is not inherent to the individual. It's a function of the relationship between that person and their environment. And this is really core to understand where we are going with this in the context from a clinical point of view, as well as from a solution point of view. We are trying to reduce the disadvantage that a person experiences because society has created barriers, unseen barriers for that person to be able to function just like everybody else. Uh, can we have the next slide, please? So what are we looking for? So the, there, are, there are multiple challenges in, in, in this field, really. Can we click once again? So the first and really the core challenge is around early identification and diagnosis. Why is that important? That's important because where you have got very evident disability arising out of physical disability or otherwise, that is very easy to spot, that is very easy to identify, that is very easy to diagnose often. And therefore, we can quickly start to put, put together means of care or means of intervention. The challenge comes particularly for autistic people and those with learning disabilities is where it is moderate and therefore it is not picked up very, very quickly. And as a result of that, that person is left to struggle. That person is left to experience pain, that person is left to experience a disadvantage because of lack of diagnosis and because of the lack of diagnosis means that nobody can make those reasonable adjustments. Uh, can we have the next line on that? And this is quite important. Why is it important? Because that disadvantage from lack of early identification and diagnosis can lead to progressive disassociation from opportunities for education in particular. I work with children and young people, particularly those who have got these conditions. And I can see every day where there is a disadvantage for in sort of conferred on that individual because we have not been able to pick that problem early enough. And that disadvantage then means that that person is suffering from mental health problems, that person can suffer from physical health problems. And as a result of that, they start to bring in, they start to experience inequalities. And as a result of that, their opportunities to flourish, their opportunities to contribute, their opportunities to fulfill their potential, that reduces. Can we have the next slide, please? So what we are trying to do, we are trying to, engineer effective support and services that will allow that person, remember that point about somebody in a wheelchair not being able to negotiate steps. Effectively, once that person is able to access the ramp and is able to climb, well, is able to access the shop, that person becomes an active contributor to the local economy. That person becomes an active contributor to the global economy. That person just stops becoming a consumer of services, but starts to become somebody who contributes to services through engagement at different levels. It goes by the same way, if, if, whichever way you think about it, if somebody is able to fulfill their potential, they become a net contributor to the economy rather than a drag on the economy. Can we have the next slide, please? How does this look like in clinical practice? What I see in my clinical practice is often where, particularly in the medical legal field, is where there is undiagnosed disorder because nobody has been able to identify what that disorder is and then it leads to a referral which can have a long wait. So that is a, again, a, a sort of a, a bottleneck where we can have entrepreneurs generating products that can help to reduce those weights. Currently, because of the long wait, we have consequential disability because of the disadvantage that that weight has conferred, which means that the potential to 
in for income generation as a person who can contribute to society that reduces those are the young people whom we see who are not in school who are not in education who are not in employment that then leads to in work poverty and then they have children who then go on to again not have the disorder diagnosed in time so what i see is this cycle that op seems to operate unfortunately within families where we as a society we as a service have not done enough to be able to help them fulfill their goals and achieve their potential uh, can i have the next slide please so what are we looking for uh, can we have that whole lot on that yeah so that's right thanks oops no the, the previous one yeah I'm sorry, it can't be seen clearly, but what we are trying to do is we, we need to reduce the hidden disability and the consequential disadvantage that comes from it. We want to reduce the impact of the longer term consequences of poor health, not just poor physical health, but also poor mental health. And what we are looking for from a clinical point of view is where we can move from these silos of both physical health, mental health, and so on and so forth, we move from silos to solutions. Can we have the next slide, please? I'm just going to share with you. Yeah, next slide. Yeah, next one. There should be a thanks. Uh, I'm sorry it can't be seen very clearly, but what we are, I'm just going to give you three scenarios, really. So, <clears throat> one which is very common amongst those with learning disability, in particular, is constipation. Can we have the next slide so that there are a few lines on that? Uh, which is a common problem with those with learning disabilities, as I said. Next line. Now, this is quite important. So those with learning disabilities, if they cannot express, if they are particularly nonverbal, the pain, the pain in the abdomen, that is interpreted, that comes out as behavior. And that, beha <clears throat> that behavior is then interpreted as being just behavior rather than the pain behind the behavior. And we have seen numerous instances and, and there, are, there are a number of uh, studies which have shown that those with learning disabilities severe so experience severe pain to the point where they have vomited their poo because nobody has been able to pay attention to their diet. Can we have the next line on that? So where can somebody amongst you come in? There could be a potential solution where you could think of, well, is there a diet app that I can produce that will allow those people who are helping those with learning disabilities in particular follow a diet plan, which can be on an app? For example, I'm just giving you one of the ideas. I'm sure there could be a number of other ones as well. Can we go to the next slide, please? Next slide, Ravi. Next slide. Bunch of problems are again extremely common in those with uh, learning disabilities. And again, dental pain, where we experience dental pain, we can communicate that there is dental pain and I've got a pain in my tooth or teeth or whatever. But those with learning disabilities, if they are non-verbal, and this is the main kind of category that we are looking at, they struggle to, because if somebody else doesn't brush their teeth, there is nobody to brush their teeth at all, which means that even if they develop caries and if they have pain, again, that pain manifests itself as behavior, which then means that actually they are treated for the behavior rather than being treated for the dental pain as they should be. There is a potential solution to that. Can somebody develop a toothpaste or a toothbrush that will actually help to identify caries depending on where those caries are by simply brushing? There are a number of potential solutions that one can think of, or you can uh, you can have a brush that can identify those caries through a microscopic camera. Who knows? Those are the kind of things which, which would be really interesting to consider going forward. Can we go to the next slide, please? The next slide, because uh, I think the thing on the right hand side is not coming up. The next slide, yeah, thanks. Uh, those uh, the autistic people, particularly autistic children, those who are on the moderate uh, uh, to severe autism, uh, struggle to understand emotions. And if you are 
if emotions, if you, if, if there is none of that reciprocity in emotions, people misunderstand what you're saying. Not only people misunderstand what you're saying, they may, as an individual, particularly children, they can get ostracized. And when they get ostracized, children with autism are known to have a vast number of mental health problems, particularly depression, and are also shown to be higher in statistics when it comes to suicide. So it will be interesting to see if there are any potential solutions out there that can help clinicians and help families, but also teachers to be able to train children and young people in understanding emotions to then be able to respond to it in a way that would make sense, not just for the young person, but also to society at large. Uh, can we have the next slide, please? Yeah, leave the, because that, that's again coming up. Yep, next slide. Thank you. Why are we saying health is wealth? Uh, because without it, what I see in my kind of medical legal and clinical practice is there is intergenerational adversity. Parents with undiagnosed, misdiagnosed, late diagnosed, neurodivergent conditions, such as learning disability, autism, and the like, they experience disadvantage in their lives, which means that their potential is squandered. They then are in poorly paying jobs, which then means that they are not able to achieve their own potential. And effectively, we are wasting social capital. There is a lot of potential in these young people. What we need to do is to be able to identify their niche and to be able to then use that niche to be able to help them prosper in the area that they have got the skills in. And when I'm working with uh, young people, I always say to them that if you have got just one skill, you will barely survive. If you have got two, you will live, live well. But to be able to succeed, I say to them, you need three skills. So one, to survive, two, to live, and three, to thrive. Uh, next slide, please. And this starts much earlier on. So if any of you is interested in educational sort of settings, there are opportunities to be able to develop some educational material that would help children and young people in being able to identify their potential and be successful so that we can have a much fairer society. And that just says how, how it is at the moment. But essentially, where we are looking at is we move from silos to solutions. Those are my, those are my contact details. Thank you ever so much for the opportunity. Fanny, over to you. Thank you very much, Girish. That was, that was really interesting and perspective on, on disabilities is quite, is quite, uh, quite fascinating to hear. Um, so thank you for that. Um, what we'll do is we'll continue with our, our, our session um, and then we'll come back to any questions you may have for Girish a little bit later on. So please do feel free to put your questions in the a, in a Q&A box. Um, but now I would like to introduce you to our next um, speakers. Um, we've got um, um, the Autistica team, um, Amanda, James, and, and Ned. Um, James is the CEO of Autistica. Uh, he joined Autistica after a career in, in autism research at the University of Aberdeen. Um, and he's got a long standing of ex experience of working directly with families affected by autism, as well as having experience in clinical, educational, and, and social care settings. Um, James sits on a number of different advisory panels and he was part of the core stakeholder groups which successfully campaigned for Scotland's first ever autism strategy. He became CEO of the charity in 2020 um, and he's the first openly autistic CEO of a, of a major charity. Uh, so it's great to have James on board. We also have Amanda, that is head of uh, research at Autistica. So Amanda's got a PhD in psychology um, and um, focused on aging and well-being in autistic adults and, and um, before returning to academia. She had a previous international career in industry. Amanda leads the research for the visionary and ambitious um, um, 2030 goals um, uh, for the charity. She has contributed to work that continues to address the autistic community's priorities and shape autism research in the UK, but also globally. Um, she's a champion of inclusive research and practice that embraces equality and diversity to understand the living experience of autistic people. And finally, we also have uh, Ned uh, from the Autistica team, um, that is Research and Partnerships Manager. Ned has experience working with autistic adults 
um, and a research background that focuses on the inclusion of autistic people with profound learning disability within social and academic contexts. Um, he worked on a number of projects uh, that included um, his PhD um, to examine how autistic people uh, and with learning disabilities contribute uh, to the service cultures that, that they're part of, uh, but also the impact of COVID on, on autism and learning disability services. So Amanda, James and Ned, welcome. Thank you very much for joining us today. It's great to have you on board. Um, and I'll pass over to you, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Fanny. And a warm welcome to everyone. We are very pleased to join the briefing call today as official partner on this Small Business Research Initiative funding call. We're especially pleased to share Autistica's vision to enable solutions that reduce health inequalities and care inequalities and improve the lives of autistic people and people with learning disabilities. I'm Dr. Amanda Rustoff, Head of Research at Autistica. I'm joined by Dr. James Cusack, Autistica CEO, and Dr. Ned Redmore, Research Grants and Partnerships Manager at Autistica, who will also be the primary contact for any questions about Autistica's strategic involvement and guidance for this call. I'll hand over to Dr. James Cusack to introduce Autistica's vision and why this topic is important to us. Next slide, please. Hi everyone and uh, thank you um, to NHR for inviting us to be a partner on this call. Um, so just to let you know we're, we're, we're the UK's leading research charity and we also do campaigning as well and um, our next slide please. Um, our vision is well for every autistic person can live a lot happy healthy long lives which means that our mission is to cre create and enable breakthroughs and make that happen by funding research shaping policy and working with autistic people to make more of a difference so if you could just move to the next slide please so in terms of um, how we define describe autism, we see autism as a lifelong neurodevelopmental condition. And the, when we talk about neurodevelopmental, we mean that um, it's a condition that uh, relates to how you develop and how you experience the world around you and how you change over time. And uh, neuro refers to the fact that this is something that occurs in, in the brain. Um, so we know that autistic people perceive and understand the world in a different way. And we know that there's around um, 1 million people in the UK who are autistic. And so we think that that's around one in 67 people. We know that every autistic person is different. And some, while some autistic people can learn, learn um, live and work independently, many other autistic people require special support. So there's a real diversity of experience um, across uh, the autism spectrum and every autistic person sees the world in a different way which means that we have a, a range of needs that we need to ensure that we're serving when we when we think when we think about autism as well um, we know that um, being autistic can uh, can be different for different people and while we think it's important to celebrate the difference is um that come with being um autistic we're we're absolutely um focused on um resolving the inequalities that autistic people face and experience and we know that autistic people face real and substantial inequalities so if we could move to the next slide please um, and what we see is that, you know, we as autistic people experience very low employment rates relative to any disabled group, um, significantly lowered life expectancy and increased likelihood to die from suicides and a high rate of mental health problems, which unfortunately and tragically leads to an increased likelihood of, of death from suicide. So if we can move to the next slide, please. Also, um, it's worth noting that autistic people also um, are like more likely to die from epilepsy and there's a higher co-occurrence of epilepsy there. And the reason for the fact that autistic people face poor outcomes in, in, in their life and, and it's substantial inequalities in their life are often 
quite socially constructed, really. And so we know that autistic people frequently wait a long time to get a diagnosis. Following that diagnosis, they don't necessarily get the support that they need and evidence-based supports. If they do get support, those interventions can quite often be limited and quite autism specific rather than needs led and something which is really sort of works for them and, and um, is defined by their sense of needs. We know that by mid childhood, um, almost half of autistic children um, meet criteria for anxiety and an anxiety disorder at any one point. And as they transition into adulthood, there's quite often a vacuum of responsibility and support. And that, that means that many autistic people uh, end up in intense services and without, uh, without work. And so that means that, you know, that too many autistic people experience an, a, a, a sort of tragic and early death. If you can just click the slides again, please. What we think should happen instead is that autistic people should get the right support and that there should be a needs-led intervention system, that we should have mechanisms in place to um, ensure that autistic people's health needs are being met. There's proper systems of stepped care. When we say stepped care, it's care that moves up and down relative to a, a person's needs at any one point. We know that um, if you're autistic, things like transition and change can be extremely difficult and that mechanisms need to be in place to ensure that care can be stepped up and support can be stepped up and stepped down um, as we need it. And that's why things like self-directed support libraries and, and forms of low intensity support are also really, really important. So one of the things we're looking a lot, lot at at the moment is things like how can apps help autistic people on a day-to-day -day basis, whereas we can have other forms of more stepped up support when autistic uh, people need them. And we hope that by doing, making these sorts of changes and implementing those sorts of changes, which should be cost effective, um, we can, by doing that, we can ensure that you know everyone wins and autistic people can live a, a long, um, healthy and happy, happy life. Um, and that's also why we set up our 2030 goals, because we think that within the next decade, um, as that it's really possible to really deliver transformative change for autistic people and their families. And um, we think that research has a pivotal role to play in that. And in fact, that we won't be able to deliver that change without high quality research, which tells us what works for autistic people, um, which is where Manza comes in. So I'll pass over to her. Thank you very much, James. Um, so I'll briefly talk to um, how we work and introduce Autistica's 2030 goals as a framework for supporting the innovative solutions that can address this funding call. Next slide, please. Autistica have developed strong and collaborative re relationships, both with NHS England and Improvement to shape policy and practice around supporting autistic people uh, and their families and people with learning disabilities. We're also trusted advisors to government bodies such as Department for Health and Social Care and Department for Education. Next slide, please. A bit about how we work is uh, primarily to identify problems, to find solutions, and then advise and influence key partners who can implement change in the right way and in the uh, um, with the right stakeholder group. So these might be, for example, services or professionals, policymakers, and regulatory bodies. Our mission is to enable the breakthroughs that make that happen by funding research and by shaping policy and working with autistic people to make more of a difference. Research is absolutely crucial to the development of practical evidence-led solutions that can achieve impact and lasting benefit for stakeholders. The process can be shorter or longer depending on the direction and the approach and also on the goal, but it is not a one-size-fits-all approach. To achieve maximum potential, we need to constantly refine and improve the solutions and build stronger evidence and synthesize best practice. To do this effectively, we need to embrace uncertainty and a level of risk to achieve the outcomes that we strive for. Some risks will be high and the rewards will be higher, and we learn from innovation and iteration to achieve success. 
anything short of excellence and scientific rigor is not an option. This is how we will reduce the harsh inequalities that so many autistic people experience across their lifespan. Next slide, please. Autistica's visionary and ambitious goals are focused on the priority areas that autistic people and their families have told us are important to them. These are not things that we will do alone as Autistica. We cannot achieve them only by ourselves, but we know that we can achieve them with help from other organizations such as yourselves. To varying degrees of application, each of these goals and, and their topics presents opportunities to create innovative evidence-led solutions that enable breakthroughs to make more of a difference and improve the lives of autistic people and people with learning disabilities. Next slide, please. This slide outlines a selection and ex of example projects that autistic people and their families have told us would make a big difference to their lives. We also know from previous research and practice that these kinds of initiatives will address health and care inequalities for autistic people and people with learning disabilities. So to reflect on James's point of earlier, we also need to consider in, uh, important factors related to intersectionality, for example, um, age appropriate adaptations and solutions, things that are specific to people of different genders or uh, cultural identities, and also co-occurring conditions and how those might affect somebody's engagement with services or might further disadvantage them from, uh, from uh, health care healthcare access and uh, social care access. We very much see this as needs-led solutions and being able to identify the barriers to accessing the right care and support at the right time, but also being able to shape and embrace the, the, uh, the aspects that will facilitate um, being able to reach the right kinds of services and to be able to create breakthroughs that enable autistic people to live happier, healthier and longer lives. Next slide, please. So I'll conclude on this slide just to provide an email address to contact uh, Autistica for strategic direction and involvement in this call. And I've also provided some references that are very much inform our work and our partnerships with NHS England and Improvement and regulatory bodies as part of the, uh, our government relationships. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Amanda and, and, and James, um, for you know giving us an overview of, of the work um, and particularly the goals uh, for, for Autistica um, on, on supporting um, uh, people with autism. So that's really insightful, and, and there's some really interesting things that we can share afterwards for, for people to refer to. Um, but also, please do take note of, of um, the email address if, if you would like to get in touch with um, James, Amanda, and, and Ned um, um, further on to, to get some support. Um, so thank you and well, welcome back to, to the team at Autistica if you've got any questions a bit later on because um, I'd like now to um, introduce you to our next speaker uh, and moving on to the maternity care challenge um, and if we can move on to the next slide um, I'd like to welcome Kelly Harvey. Um, Kelly is a senior lead nurse and advanced neonatal nurse practitioner at the Northwest Neonatal Operational Delivery Network uh, and that's at the Aldehy NHS uh, Foundation Trust. Kelly has 20 years experience as a neonatal nurse, um, but also as an educator, manager, and advanced nurse practitioner. She's a member of the National Neonatal Nurses Association Executive Committee, um, and was a neonatal nursing advisor for the National Neonatal GUFT um, project. Um, so Kelly is really committed to improving the family experience of neonatal services and ensuring that the voice of the neonatal community is heard. And so really look forward to, to hearing your perspective, Kelly. Welcome, um, and over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fanny. So um, yeah, so I'm here, I'm here to talk about the health inequalities in maternity care, but clearly, as Fanny's just introduced, I am neonatal focused. So I have tried very hard to ensure that the, the voice of the mum and the family are part of what we talk about today. Um, so next slide, please. So there's currently uh, a lot of national focus on maternity care, which is excellent and very much welcomed by uh, both maternity and neonatal services. 
and it's very much around improving um, the safety of maternity care and in turn improving neonatal outcomes. Um, and so there's just a couple of documents on there. So there's the Better Births program is, is really important around maternity transformation. Um, and part of that Better Births program is the implementing the recommendations of the Neonatal Critical Care Review. And again, that's having a huge influence on how neonatal services will look in the future. And that in turn has an impact on how uh, families experience neonatal care. The Embrace report is an important one to look at. So every year they produce a report around uh, maternity and neonatal death, and they very much focus upon the um, impact of health inequalities uh, on maternal and neonatal outcomes and their stark findings. So if you're going to read anything following this presentation, I would suggest that you have a look at the lay summary of that to help you to understand just the impact of inequalities um, on uh, family experiences of maternity and neonatal care. Um, we also have the Maternity Neonatal Safety Improvement Programme, and that has really allowed both maternal and neonatal teams to have a voice, to come together, to see that they're both working in the same direction um, and to support improvements in care. Um, and that links very much with the Academic Health Science Network and the work that they are doing is bringing those teams together uh, for quality improvement. Um, and then it's, I really want to focus very much on the family's experience in the, um, in the few minutes that I've got today to talk about uh, maternity care. Um, and there's been a very recent um, document produced, which was the Ockenden Report, which I'm, I'm assuming a number of you will have heard of through media or other, or other sources. And again, it brings into focus the need for um, clear improvements in neonatal and maternity care. Um, to ensure that families have a better experience than, that, than they've had in the past. Um, so next slide, please. Um, so I really want to just talk you through a neonatal journey. And like I said, I, I do want to not make it all about neonates, um, but actually there's always a maternity journey if there is a neonatal uh, journey involved. So next, if you just press again for this slide, thank you. So um, I know it's not a healthcare audience necessarily, so I really want you to think about um, being in this mum's position, I suppose, and then try to think about how that might inform what needs to be done to improve this, this mum's experience. This is not unique. Um, this happens a lot. Um, so a mum in very early um, pregnancy, so 26 weeks, might present at her local hospital. She perhaps doesn't speak English um, and she is in established labour. So she's seen by the maternity team, but she has to deliver. So she delivers at that unit. Uh, the baby's born and stabilised. However, that particular unit that that baby's born in does not care for babies of that low gestation. And that's what neonatal services are like across the country. So some units will care for babies um, below 27 weeks and provide all neonatal intensive care. And other units will not. They will be the local unit for the family, but the intensive care activity will happen at a, a tertiary centre. And so what will happen is in this case, a baby is stabilised, but is then shipped out to another hospital, which could be 20 to 30 miles away. Uh, if mum's then unwell and she's unable to get a maternity bed in uh, the hospital where her baby's been transferred to, she will have to remain in the hospital 20 miles away um, until she's well enough to be discharged. And in this case, uh, mum remains there for three days. So again, putting ourselves in that mum's position she's nowhere near a baby. She's no idea what's happening to a baby. She's not really seen her baby. Um, and she's stuck in a, in, a, in a hospital a number of miles away. And obviously we've got a wider family um, involved in that. So we've then got a dad who's split between the baby that's in one hospital and the mum that's in another hospital and actually the three kids at home and the fact that he's gonna at some point need to get back to work. Mum will then be uh, discharged home and then able to go and visit her baby or see her baby in the neonatal intensive care unit. Um, but clearly she arrives at a hospital, bearing in mind she's, no, she's non-English speaking, to a hospital where she doesn't know where anything is, she's never been to before in her life. Her baby is somewhere within that hospital, she doesn't really know where, and when she arrives nobody really knows who she is. Um, the baby then spends eight weeks in that particular hospital, um, and mum begins to build trust with that team, gains confidence in caring for her baby. But then the way that pathways work within neonatal care is that that baby will then be transferred back to its home unit, if you like. So it's local unit, local to where that family live. It has to work like that. We have to have space in neonatal intensive care units, but that's clearly a pinch point for families where they've gained trust 
with people caring for their precious baby and then they're moved to another team. Um, so babies then transferred back to the local neonatal unit. She then has to rebuild her trust with that team and start to progress to understanding how she'll care for this vulnerable baby at home. So after a further six weeks, baby is then transferred home, has some additional needs, so is her on home oxygen. And during the COVID pandemic, that would be the first point at which that baby had come into contact with its siblings. The first time that that family had actually been together as a family unit. And clearly what happens very commonly is that the entire family struggle to cope with the events that happen during this journey. And they feel unable to access help and they're not heard or they feel like they're not heard. And this really is a regular occurrence and, and we do lots to try to support that. And there's lots of work ongoing already around family integrated care and support for families during this journey. But the reality is this is the reality for families and they are struggling to access the right support. And there is a long term impact on a family unit. So not just on a mum, not just on the baby that is in the neonatal unit, but actually that family have to function forever together. And starting like this often impacts on how they are able to do that. Next slide, please. And what I've used here is um, some words from uh, there was a project that we did in the Northwest around understanding neonatal families and hearing what they had to say. Um, and so this I've just put a, a few quotes in from some family members, some um, dads and mums that have experienced neonatal care to help us to really focus our minds on what we're trying to achieve here, what we're trying to improve. And that is the experience for families that go through maternity and neonatal care. And so I won't read them, re read through them, but you will get the slides. So the impact is huge. Um, next slide. And so what matters to family is a, continu a continuity. So that journey we've talked about is the fact that, you know, a mom and a baby will be separated. They will be hearing different messages from different people or they won't be hearing anything at all. Um, and so that continuity of communication, of access to healthcare professionals is incredibly important to families and being informed. So having the information they need um, to be able to support their baby and their family. And so again, just some quotes here from families to help you understand what that feels like to a family when they don't get that continuity and how important it is that communication when that mum is discharged or when she's still in the maternity service or when she goes to one neonatal unit to another or actually when she's discharged home with that baby. Actually, none of the impact of what's happened tends to hit until they've left. And so how are we maintaining that continuity and that information giving uh, to families throughout uh, their journey and beyond, really. Uh, next slide. And communication is really key. And I guess we're hoping for some innovations around that. Um, better communication between maternity and neonates on so many levels um, around supporting um, babies being born in the right place for a start. Um, and then how um, families are kept informed by both teams and how families are prepared for what is to come when they're going into a neonatal journey. You know, there really isn't any information out there antenatally um, to support families. Uh, so giving that information, we may feel like we're going to scare everybody, but actually if families can't access information, they feel like they are not part of that journey um, and they are underprepared for that and that and ends up having a much bigger impact on their, uh, potentially on their mental health following this, this journey. Uh, next slide, please. And so it is around that communication between families, professionals, different teams, different hospitals, um, and ensuring that that family are supported. So a bit um, a mum that goes into labour early has never been spoken to about the fact that you might have your baby early and what that might mean, is then thrust into a world that they don't understand. Um, watching their vulnerable baby being um, cared for um, and not really knowing what to do around that. And then having no view that actually there are some pathways over here that mean that you can't even stay in the hospital that you are familiar with, you have to go elsewhere. And there are experiences where families have multiple births, so twins, one baby is in one hospital, one baby is in another hospital. And I think we just have to remind ourselves how that must feel for that family unit and how what can we do to bring that family unit together uh, better. Uh, next slide, please. And so um, Fanny talked earlier around 
part of this work is understanding the impact on perinatal mental health. Um, and there's lots of work currently ongoing around perinatal mental health um, nationally. But I think it's really important that when a family enter a neonatal unit, they are very likely to end up with a perinate, a, an issue with their mental health. And if we don't support them through that and help them to recognise that that is expected, the impact of that is long term. So there are a significant number of families that have um, mum or dad or both diagnosed with significant anxiety and, and post-traumatic stress disorder. And it will have an impact and it does have an impact on the way that they are able to bond with their baby. Um, and if we don't help them to understand that and help them through that journey with the right support, peer support, information, um, we're doing them a disservice really, we're, impact, we're, we're, we're increasing the impact that that might have. Um, so we're really keen to try to, to get that voice out there, but also to bring in um, really some low level stuff that would be able to support families throughout their journey, every family that enters a neonatal unit, every family that has a traumatic experience within maternity care, to be able to access the right information, the right support, um, to make that journey easier so that the impact long-term um, is reduced. Uh, next slide, please. And again, just some, some really clear quotes from families around how, what an impact this has had it's isolating, it's destroyed people's mental health. They've ended up with diagnoses of PTSD, severe anxiety. Um, and this, this impact lasts lifelong. You know, this person describes here that four years later, they're still feeling those repercussions. I have spoken to families 20 years later that can still recollect and still have trauma from the experience that they have been through. Um, and so we, re we really need to do something to support those families. Next slide, please. And so what we need really is a change in culture and therefore a change in systems. And this diagram really just helps us to see that the baby sits in the centre of everything that we do, both maternity and neonatal care. And then you've got a family that sits around that and then a wider support network and then the staff within the NHS and then the, the environment that all of that um, care occurs in both maternity and neonatal. And then we need some support around that as well, around psychological support. And so bringing all of those layers in and ensuring that every family and every baby has the best experience for their outcome. There are things that need to be done. There are nuances in systems that mean that this doesn't work well or we don't have the right support around families. And so it's important to try to break that down and understand what could support. Um, and a lot of that when we've talked um, previously is around information giving and people really understanding what the experience might be, what they need to do to support families and then having access to that support. Next slide, please. Um, so I guess bringing it back to that health inequalities um, uh, title really is every, every nuance within the wider society of um, ethnic minority, social deprivation, underlying comorbidities, education levels, all of those, you know, age of mother, teenage pregnancy, social um, safeguarding issues, all of those families come through maternity and neonatal care. And so the inequalities that we see in any area of healthcare are very much seen within maternity and neonatal care. And they need, we need to recognise them to ensure that the impact, so anything that we bring in, for example, information giving and so on, has to be geared to all areas of society. Um, and so, as I say, if you look at the Embrace report, it's very clear that social deprivation, maternal age, ethnic, uh, ethnic minorities are hugely impacted in their maternal and neonatal outcomes by these inequalities. Um, and we really have to acknowledge them and try to support um, to support them. Uh, next slide, please. And so I think it's important, and for and for this uh, session particularly, is around what what do they need then? What do women and families need to support reducing the impact of a maternity and neonatal journey, and um, reducing the impact of inequalities, so their social inequalities um, on their experience of those journeys. And I think first and foremost, it is to ask them what they feel they need 
So that's what we did within our network project around understanding um, the uh, voice of families and what a neonatal experience meant to them. It, it's not just asking them at one point in their journey. It's really understanding where we can gain valuable feedback from women as they enter maternity services, when they've had a particular experience in a maternity service, and then if they've headed into a neonatal service and then actually post-discharge, what was the impact? impact of that journey on them um, and so we may do some you know family and friends test as they're discharged from the hospital but are we truly getting what matters to them um, from those tests or is there something more for us to be able to do to actually listen to what families need um, from their maternity journey um, and and to hear everybody's voice so to ensure that it's not only those people that can um, read um, it's not only those people that can access IT um, that are able to give us their feedback, but all families and all minority groups are um, heard when we ask them what, what is important to them within our services. I've said quite a lot through the session that actually forewarned, forewarned is forearmed, actually giving people information about what might happen to them um, and actually what when that does happen to them, what that might mean and what that might mean for their mental health or what that might mean um, for their journey within uh, the healthcare system. Um, we have to have more information out there, but we also have to have that in an accessible format for everybody. And again, when we think about those different groups of health inequalities, um, it's really important that the content is appropriate and it's accessible for all. And that certainly is not the case currently. Um, information that we give out is generally a leaflet that has to be read um, and you know we know that there are the reading age in certain areas of um, the country is uh, around the age of eight um, that's that's not going to be helpful when we're giving out just a generic leaflet that's for everybody different languages there's very limited languages that um, information is available in um, we all talk about potentially moving to apps and digital, which is great. And clearly I'm, I'm a big fan of that. But actually, if you've got a socially deprived family that don't have access to Internet or don't have a smartphone, actually, we need to think about how we are reaching those communities as well. Um, and giving families access to informed and knowledgeable staff. So thinking about the continuity, ensuring that staff are educated to a point they are able to understand the intricacies of health inequalities on families journeys and their um, experience and we have to take the lead on that as health professionals to ensure that we have the information we need to be able to support families um, and just recognition so we've talked um, a little bit around um, recognizing for families that what they're going through is a trauma but actually there are other elements of a, a pregnancy journey where you need to identify families at risk so at risk of particular um, conditions and those conditions may then impact on their pregnancy journey and may result in a neonatal admission and then they head into the the journey of a neonatal um, experience which will have a further impact on them and their outcomes so identifying those early and then identifying that those people are at risk of having a neonatal journey or a, a traumatic experience um, will help to provide personalized care to ensure that the information is given to the right groups of people um, and then really importantly, and I can't believe that I've left it to last, but really importantly, um, ensuring that those families have a community. Um, and it was very clear when COVID hit that that's what a lot of families lost. And I think it will be a number of years before we fully understand the impact of that um, COVID on neonatal services and neonatal families, because, you know, that support system that I described in one of the earlier slides, baby, family, wider parents and wider family families lost that and restrictions on parent access to neonatal services were, were very difficult at the beginning of COVID. And what we know from a lot of work that's been done is actually having peer-to-peer -peer support throughout a journey helps families deal with that better. And they were unable to access that during COVID. So having access to peer support, whether that be in person, whether that be online, whether that be in any kind of format that we can achieve, will make a difference to families that are going through uh, maternity and neonatal services and improve that level of communication and ensure that we as health professionals are able to support them properly when we can and also point them in the right direction for that peer-to-peer -peer support. 
Um, so I think that's me done. Uh, just any questions for me, but I think we're going into a QA panel anyway, aren't we? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Kalina. So really insightful to hear the sort of neonat um, journey and, and sort of all the, the difficulty throughout that journey uh, and, and a bit on the health inequality. So yeah, thank you very much for that. Um, we're running a little bit behind, so we're just going to sort of um, take a few questions now and then and then move on to, to the next um, the next session. Um, so we, we're probably going to allow about five minutes for, for some um, Q&A. So if we could um, invite back our speakers with um, Kelly, Girish, um, Amanda, I think James might not be with us anymore, but um, Ned as well, um, to join the Q&A session. And, and um, I'm going to read some, some questions put, posted by the audience. Um, and perhaps direct them directly to you. So if you've got any questions for um, Kelly, Girish uh, and Amanda, please feel free to, to put them in the Q&A box. Um, so I think we've, we had one for um, you perhaps, Kelly, first. Um, in your, I guess it's Northwest research, um, did you get any feedback on communication and support with health visitors? Um, so yes, we did. Absolutely. Really good question. Um, and we're doing a little bit of work in the Northwest to try to understand how we can improve um, communication with health visitors, but also raise awareness with health visitors, <coughs> excuse me, um, of that neonatal journey. So what we found is that health visitors in the community have very limited knowledge of what happens on a neonatal unit and therefore what the impact of that journey has been on that family. And as you know, when they go into the community, often that's the only uh, healthcare professional that they'll then see. Um, to support them with their family bonding and their experiences at home and so we have recognized that most definitely and we've pulled together a resource training package for health visitors um, to support them in understanding that neonatal journey and, and how to support families uh, through that but there's there's more work to do most definitely. Great thank you it's interesting and um, we've got a question perhaps on, on, on autism I know Gary you, you may have provided some answers but uh, maybe the, that, that could be of interest to the to the rest of the of the audience um, whether the session today applies to high functioning autism or only to autism and learning disabilities. So I wonder, um, Girish and Amanda, if you had any thoughts on that and, and your views perhaps. So I think as, as I mentioned in my presentation, I think the, the categories of high functioning, low functioning, whatever else said and done, I think what we are looking for is autism, whether it is high functioning or not high functioning. In fact, those with high functioning autism, if, if that, if, if you don't necessarily use the term high functioning autism, uh, but those who do not appear to be quote unquote autistic uh, and who are not, who are not sort of yet diagnosed to be autistic often experience the most severe mental health problems. And the same applies to those with learning disabilities as well, because learning disabilities in a sense encompasses a range of challenges uh, of which some can be quickly identified, but the vast majority are very difficult to identify straight away. But looking at support structures, irrespective of the cause, would be what would be helpful from a technological point of view, because then those support structures can also be rolled out to other, other conditions as well. Okay, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Girish. Um, it's really helpful. Um, we've got some other questions coming. So perhaps um, there was a question perhaps I can address quickly. So it, it was whether the, the, the call is focusing on the content that Kelly's talked about or whether there's a, a sort of a wider approach. Um, and then, yes, we, we had really Kelly talking about the, the neonatal services and the pressure on those. Um, but we the, the call actually includes a wider uh, maternity um, generally. So the sort of perinatal journey, um, sort of even pre-pregnancy, pregnancy, and then sort of postnatal. So uh, what we'll do is we'll invite you to um, have a look at the challenge brief. Um, and then there's also going to be another session on, on Q&A and um, scheduled in, in two or three weeks. Um, so, so that answers that, that question. Um, so what, I'm just looking quickly if we've got anything else. Um, so we've got a question on, on um, at the beginning mentioning a need for innovations and accessible support for women and on discharge from hospital and beyond. Um, and whether there's a specific category of the competition um, that they focus on that. So again, that, that's coming back to um, the, the specific category on the support to women post discharge. I think Elise discussed a little bit about that sort of difficult transition from um, sort of a, a neonatal journey to transfer home 
And so that's part of it, but it's a, actually a wider approach of, of um, discharge home and sort of monitoring and, and, and support uh, once a, a woman is discharged. Um, there was another question, I think, on perhaps digital products. I don't know if, if Gary Charmander, you wanted to comment on that. Um, how essential is it for the innovation to, to be a digital product? Um, um, so Gemma said that some of her hand users are digitally excluded and that raises more issue than helping with healthy quality. And so I don't know, maybe Amanda, you had some thoughts on that considering the sort of digital exclusion and sort of digital technologies. Yeah, thank you very much. That's a really important question and I'm really glad that, that you were um, thinking about that. Um, I wanted to also loop this back to the earlier question about um, uh, the, the focus was phrased about high and low functioning and we would advise against that kind of referencing because those terms in and of themselves are quite disadvantaging to, to the community and it focuses very much on a, on a deficit um, model uh, of, of providing solutions. And that's not how we see um, the maximum opportunity to be able to uh, create impact and support the autistic community here. So with that, um, with that in mind, there will be, regardless of level of cognitive skills and, and level of support needs, there will be different types of solutions for different service users. So it's very much about understanding who the audience is that you're trying to support and what the problem is that you're trying to address. So for some of those, while the end user might not be the user of the technology, technology can be used to facilitate their access to a service, for instance. So it might be, for example, um, improving the ways in which communication is shared with end service users. So using technology-based solutions to facilitate the sharing of information, or it might be providing a platform that um, provides families and carers with the right kind of high quality evidence and uh, information to be able to understand what options there are, what referral pathways look like, what um, treatment solutions there might be for anxiety, for instance. So it's not necessarily that technology or digital solutions need to be with the um, the end user being the, the user of that technology, but as a facilitator to be able to reduce those health inequalities. That's great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Girish. Yeah, I just, just wanted to uh, entirely uh, agree with everything that Amanda said. And I just wanted to sort of uh, add something more to it, really, in the sense that the major kind of challenge that, from a clinical point of view, we experience is around uh, young, around school going uh, children, uh, particularly with, uh, with their challenges in learning and in education and adapting. Uh, the education material to those with neurodiverse needs. So if you're thinking of solutions, I think that's a very big, uh, not just a market to kind of tap into, but also you'll be providing a solution to a vast number of uh, uh, children and indeed their parents, because the parents struggle because nobody can tell them how their child could be helped. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's important as well. Um, Okay, so I think it's, it's just uh, mindful of the time. We probably need to move on to our, our next session. So I'd like to, to thank you again, Girish and um, Kelly and Amanda for, for um, coming to, to talk today and, and answering some of the questions. If we've got time, we might be able to come back to a few towards the end. Um, but I think I'd, I'd like to sort of um, introduce our, our next speaker. So thank you again for, for your contribution today. Um, so our next two speakers are um, um, Helen and um, Charlotte. Um, so um, first of all, I'd like to introduce you to, to Helen. And Helen is, is Program Lead of Innovation and Relationship at the Yorkshire um, and Hunger AHSN. And she's responsible for developing and, and sustaining strategic partnership, um, particularly with NHS leaders, academia, a large industry, uh, national and regional scientific and academic bodies and, and collaborative programs. So there's a really sort of wide approach. Um, so Helen, um, welcome. Thanks for joining us today. Um, and, and we look forward to, to hearing all about the HSN. Over to you. Thank you. That's great. Nice to see everybody. Thank you. I'll just wait for my uh, first slide to pop up. 
Thanks. So I'm here today. Um, I'm from Yorkshire and Hunger Academic Health Science Network, but I'm representing the wider AHSN network here today. Um, we're huge supporters of the SBRI award. Um, we support the programme team nationally. Um, and we also, all, each of us will have a, a commercial facing team where we support, give direct support to um, SMEs and innovators who are wanting to make um, an application to this particular award. Next slide, please. Um, as you've already seen, there's 15 of us across the country. We're um, funded primarily from NHS England and the Office of Life Sciences. Um, so we work really embedded within our respective healthcare economies in each of our geographies. Um, but we also work closely together. We're very much a network of networks um, and we share ideas and we work to, to support spread uh, pan region as well. Next slide, please. So our three main aims really are around improving health and improving population health and individual patient care and service improvement and quality improvement and transformation across our respective geographies, um, working to support cost reduction, value for money, productivity, et cetera, with our local healthcare economies and driving growth um, and in leveraging investment into our respective regions. So um, we do that across a broad array of, of um, programmes at e each of our AHSNs. Next slide, please. So each AHSN works um, across an innovation pathway. Um, so we have an offer to innovators, which is right from very early stage ideation, um, prototyping right the way through to something that's proven, tested, evaluated, evidence-based, and is ready for um, you know, further adoption and at scale. Um, and so we have this sort of holistic pathway here that we um, support innovators across. And you can see that SBRI is, is um, right slap bang in the middle of that. It's, a, it's very important to us. It's something that we um, continue to support. So um, if an innovator is interested in the competition, um, go and speak to your AHSN. They can give you expert guidance and advice. Um, also link you up with um, the relevant stakeholders in, in the system to um, ascertain if there is a no need in that particular geography for this particular call. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, um, we have a, each HSN has its own innovation pipeline. So from the discover early stage right through to deploy in the development um, phase, we can offer you advice and support around proof of value. Um, we can support you with real world evidence and real world evaluation. Um, so again, it's, it's something that each HSN has um, in common. Um, and all of the innovations in our pipeline are sort of known and aggregated at a national level. So we can go in if we want to and understand what's working well in another area. Is there a particular need? Um, what's known and validated? So if, you're, if your innovation is meeting a known need and there's, there's, um, there's a sort of a pull from the system in our geography, then we will work very closely with you and give you bespoke support. Next slide, please. Thanks. So as, as I've said, we're, we're here to look at um, really importantly horizon scanning and identifying and understanding what the unmet needs of our NHS and care system are. Um, we support um, looking at potential solutions with market analysis and due diligence of companies who may be wanting to apply for SBRI or the grant funding. We support real world validation, which is really important. So um, how does something work in a particular local pathway? What can we learn from that? What's the impacts, the benefits realization and how will that translate into future spread and scale? And we also share best practice across the whole of the network. Next slide, please. So um, in terms of SBRI specifically, um, how can we help you as an innovator who may be thinking about um, applying for this particular call? Um, so we've got the intelligence, we're very linked in and embedded within our healthcare systems. We understand what the priorities are at a really granular level and what some of the un unmet needs are at place and at system. We understand the mark, we've got a market awareness of what's coming through the pipeline, what's on the horizon, where some of the gaps are, so where you may have a very unique USP or meet a very, very specific need, so we can um, advise you around that. Um, as I've mentioned, we do lots of stakeholder engagement, clinical procurement, commissioning uh, with regional experts um, to ensure that we can sort of bring people together uh, to solve these problems. Um, and all of this contributes to, as I said, longitudinal improvements in patient care, which is a key priority for the HSNs. Next slide, please. So that's our offer. Um, as I've, I think I've gone through everything there, generally speaking, we can give advice about the application, how to develop the application. We can help review your application with you. 
Um, we understand some of the um, other suppliers and innovators that may be in your particular space. Um, we can talk about um, linking you up with clinical leaders or academic partners in the region, uh, particularly advice around patient engagement as well, um, PPI, and what might be the impact on the patient experience of your particular solution, which is hugely important, and also to think about the health economic angle as well. So return on investment and speaking in the language of, um, of value for, for commissioners in particular in the future. Next slide, please. So that's it. Um, please do get in touch if you'd like to have a chat about this particular call, um, or you can go onto the AHSN Network website and find your local AHSN, and they'd be really pleased to, uh, to speak to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Helen. It's really good to hear about uh, the, the, what the AHSN does and, and um, how you support innovators. Um, and now we'll, I'd like to introduce you to, to Charlotte, um, that is going to, to take over from now. So, so Charlotte is Programme Director and uh, Designer at the Southwest CHSN, uh, and she leads the Health Equity Strategy. Um, so Charlotte carries a real passion for uh, social innovation, particularly um, as they may involve service design and, and system change. Uh, so Charlotte's held um, roles both leading service innovation and business development. Um, and has a particular interest in how to improve people's involvement in the design and the delivery of services. Um, so hi Charlotte, thanks for joining today. Um, um, and Charlotte's going to talk to us a little bit about the work that they've done on um, the factors that were found to affect perinatal outcomes in the, in, in the UK. Over to you Charlotte. Thanks, thanks Sunny for inviting, um, thanks for inviting me. It's really exciting to be here and also thanks to Helen for an amazing overview of what AH sends do because they're not always that simple to understand and of having been at the southwest for only about five months that's that was just a fantastic um so at the southwest hsn uh we do all the things that um helen mentioned but we happen to have which is fantastic timing um a regional health equity program on perinatal um so a, a big part of that has been about understanding the research and different factors around inequalities. And um, we've been doing that both through kind of desk research, stakeholder engagement, pathway pieces of work, and engaging with users through user research, um, all trying to really kind of understand um, women's experiences um, who, who may face a number or one health you know, element of inequalities. So I'm just gonna kind of whiz through a few slides around some of the things we found and kind of maybe just draw out some of the elements. So I think also it was Kelly who I came in on the back of um, to her slides and, and covered you know, some of this work. And it was also great to see the alignment uh, that you know, we, we were also gonna be saying sort of similar or the same things. Um, but some of the factors that you know, are found to affect outcomes and it, you know, were touched upon earlier. So. Um, ethnicity being a key one. I think drawing out some that are really important for the Southwest or a rural geography to so rurality is one of those big challenges and access around um, travel and fuel and heating. So, you know, driving to an appointment has been too expensive. So when we talk about kind of what that means in terms of, you know, why women might not be showing up or um, accessing um, things. Um, there's kind of the health um, factors, you know, uh, BMI, um, smoking drug and alcohol use and again like you know we talk about these factors at a high level and I think one of the things that I'm really interested for innovators is how you really understand this both at a yes at a kind of you know literature and data level but what's your understanding of what people's lived experience is like um, for those factors you know so what does it what does it feel like to experience a service um, you know if you happen to also be going through drug and alcohol services at the same time um, as an example um, next slide, please. So kind of the flip side, again, you know, part of our research is about what are the factors found to facilitate them, uh, perinatal outcomes, and some of them are kind of big things, you know, providing continuity of care, part of our national strategy and plans. But actually what's been touched upon today is establishing networks, group peer support, um, working um, with communities and working deeply, and I suppose developing an empathetic um, relationship and that could be, you know, right through from, all, you know, all um, people who are working with women and their families going through um, services or, or outside. I think one thing that's quite interesting is when we talk about pregnancy, we also often talk about the intense periods of certain parts of the pathway. What we've tried to do at the Southwest Edge then is think about some of these challenges, as funny sort of alluded to earlier, right through to sort of preconceptions, you know, what are the challenges? We know there's 
challenges around women from more deprived communities, you know, not taking folic acid, for example, which is going to obviously lead to poor outcomes. Um, and, you know, late booking being another, you know, another challenge for women from black minority ethnic uh, background and, and also um, from women from deprived communities. So thinking about kind of a range of factors all the way through to once the baby's born. Uh, next slide, please. So just going to sort of into barriers. So again, language and communication, like I was, it was great, but also sort of harrowing to hear again that come up earlier today. So kind of so many women that we spoke to, this was such a challenge. I uh, spent time talking to women with learning disabilities who kind of just to build on the earlier point, you know, exactly as was said, you know, being handed a leaflet is, wasn't helpful, made them feel silly. They didn't understand being told to go away and Google something or look it up. Actually, that just isn't going to help uh, and, and made them feel confused, upset and scared. Um, some pragmatic issues. So for us, particularly in rural areas, but I appreciate um, this is, you know, also applicable in urban contexts. The issues around kind of access to services, um, trying to get childcare sorted. If you've got an hour's drive to the hospital and you have to get the only way to get there is by car and you've limited access to a car because there's only one car for your family, you know, and who's going to look after the children, you know, currently when, you know, children aren't often allowed into appointments. Um, and then kind of wider kind of factors um, around social services environments and what else is going on in people's lives so it's you know what matters to them you know what's the most pressing thing um on their mind at the moment is it paying the bills you know is that is that why they haven't even thought about going to their appointment because you know they're worried about you know feeding their children or paying the bills so some of those kind of um common services and then i suppose we picked up some of the unique barriers um where there was particularly observed and we you know we've got a literature review in more detail around this but particularly some unique barriers for traveling communities and bereaved parents and i think has been touched upon migrant and ethnic minority communities and again around the call particularly accessing mental health services next slide please so finally sort of some of the some of the factors that we found to facilitate and again you know drawn out of um you know national local insight um so use of language i think has been touched on um you know a lot uh, the cultural competencies and sensitivities and there's quite a lot of work going on around cultural awareness training and the, and the role that that can play uh, potentially play in supporting and improving um outcomes um, some of these are sort of more suggestions that have come out. So you'll see like using picture cards, language apps, different elements that have come out from the feedback that we've accessed. Um, there's something around like the risk stratifications um, element, I think maybe for women who have particular conditions and the access to managing those conditions early on. Um, so appropriate access to that. Um, I think for one of the big things coming out around peer mentoring, so there are a lot of women talking about the value of peer mentoring and how that makes a difference, but also recognising that peer mentoring in itself can feel a bit exclusive to certain groups. So, you know, some of the breastfeeding groups, oh, well, it's great there's breastfeeding groups, but actually there weren't women that were like me at those breastfeeding groups, and I, I wasn't sure that they were that accessible. So how do we make that peer support offer, um, you know, more broad and reach a wider audience of women and um, when we know the women who do access it find it really valuable i think i won't go into detail about kind of technological solutions and and you know both the kind of huge opportunity there but obviously the real challenge both in our experience in terms of technology solutions reaching um, women and in terms of testing their innovations so you know you have a product and it works and you've tested it but have you really tested it and reached those women that you know you say that you know need it most um and then finally i think that's my final slide um next slide if there is one and if not um oh yeah so there's some of the learning so again adopting things across a whole life course approach so we know that in general um, so for me that's about thinking of things across the journey um, and also outside of the perinatal pathway and where where your solution fits in um, thinking about co-design right from the start um, it's really difficult and, and that's you know that's the challenge isn't it um, it shouldn't be easy um, it is difficult and it takes time it takes resource and it takes energy um, and you know maybe thinking about planning um, you know the work you would do with people that you're trying to reach as an innovator I kind of urge you to think about what you'll be giving back in that process um, if you are going to engage with people um, 
and then you know supporting um services that support others so gaps with birthing partners so things that um, we've sort of funded already um so just to kind of sum up conscious of time um we're super excited to be supporting uh, this call for innovation we haven't funded a number of um, innovations in the southwest already under our own uh, call um last year we um can offer a lot of support around uh, supporting innovators in perinatal health equity in the southwest and that's Devon, Somerset and Cornwall um, because we've got a whole program of work for the next three years around that so, so yes we have the kind of usual AHSN offer but I suppose my kind of um, pitch to, to those listening is that we're particularly interested in, in you know being able to support and work with um, innovators in the southwest where we've got a lot of work on our program today and, and spend a lot of time with stakeholders and, and supporting a number of innovations already so thank you for your time thank you very much Hannah. really useful to see and, and also to hear you know that there's some of the result of, of your work and your findings so i um, really appreciate that and thank you Ellen, as well um earlier um, so now I would like to um, move on to our, our sort of uh, final presentation, and it's just a, um, a, a quick overview of um, the application process and also the assessment for this competition, um, SBRI Healthcare Competition. Um, so um, Randa, I will come back now to uh, give you a bit of an overview of, of the process and, and some tips, and we'll hopefully have some questions, time for some questions towards the end. Uh, Randa, over to you. Thanks, Manny. Um, so hi again, everyone. Um, so I'll be giving an overview of the application process and what that involves um, and provide a quick guidance on how to submit an application form online using the research management system. So in terms of the application process, um, the process begins by us inviting companies and organizations such as yourselves to come forward with their solutions to challenges described earlier um, by submitting online applications. And these applications are reviewed by a pool of experts covering clinical, technical, and commercial expertise. And up to 25 applications are shortlisted. And following the shortlisting, um, all shortlisted applicants are invited to submit a video pitch to support their application. So that would be a three minute video. Um, and that will be reviewed um, alongside the application form uh, by a panel of experts, again, covering clinical, commercial, and technical expertise, who will then recommend um, the applications to receive phase one funding. And the number of applications that are funded depends on the quality of the applications that receive and the total budget available um, that year. Um, and then the outcome following that um, meeting will be communicated to the applicants. And we do have a short uh, turnaround um, for when we contract projects. So usually successful applicants are contracted shortly thereafter within um, around a, couple, a few weeks within a month. Um, if awardees are successful at phase one, um, they can bid for phase two funding to continue product development and testing. And phase two funding isn't guaranteed. It is a competitive process. Um, so uh, there will be an application process. So all phase one awardees will be invited to submit a phase two application close to the end of their phase one projects. And these applications will be assessed by external peer reviewers as well as um, a panel. Um, and there will be um, an interview um, as part of that assessment. So applicants will be invited to present to the panel and then they will recommend um, applications to receive phase two funding. Next slide, please. In terms of the assessment of phase one applications, um, assessments are carried out based on eight different criteria. And these include um, the effect of the proposal on the challenges outlined in the challenge brief, the appropriateness of the project plan, deliverables, and risk mitigation strategies, um, the innovativeness and competitive advantage of the solution over existing solutions, um, the appropriateness of the commercialization and implementation plans, um, considerations uh, towards the patient and public involvement and engagement, um, as well as the potential of the technology to enhance equity of access and contribute to net zero emissions. Um, and then the last is around the experience and skills of the project team and partners and the value for money. Next slide, please. 
Um, so as you heard, the assessment criteria is pretty all encompassing. And so the application process is quite competitive. And to give you an idea of the success rate um, of all the applications that we've received for phase one competitions, around 9% have been successful. And of those awarded at phase one, around 50% received phase two funding. Um, but don't let those numbers scare you off, but rather just emphasize that when you are filling out the application form to make sure that um, it's completed to the highest quality and with as much detail as possible, um, bearing in mind those eight criteria that I mentioned earlier um, so that you can better your chances of success. Next slide, please. So in terms of how you can actually apply to the program, you'll need to visit our website and the details are here. Um, and on the main page, you'll see a link to the competition page. Um, and this will take you to a page where all of our live competitions are. Um, next slide, please. So you'll need to select the um, relevant competition that you're interested in. And on each individual competition page, you'll find a bunch of supporting documentation that provides information on the program, the application process, um, and guidance on completing the application form, including a template of the application form and a FAQs document as well. And then you'll also find the link to the actual application portal, which will redirect you to um, the research management system where you submit your application. Next slide, please. So this is what the research management system portal looks like. Um, so please note that applications have to be made through this online portal and only registered users can apply. So if you're new to the portal, you should register as a new user. Next slide, please. Um, once you're logged into your account, um, the home page is where you can create new applications. So you can start a new application by either clicking on um, the link under new grant application on the home page, or you can go to my applications in the left hand menu and click on the new application button. Next slide, please. This will take you to a page with a list of our open funding rounds. Um, and so you'll just need to select the correct competition call and then click apply to open an application form. Next slide, please. Um, from there, you'll be directed to the application summary page and you'll see all the different sections of the application form um, on the left hand side there. And as you're going through the form, um, most questions will have a question mark icon that you can click on that provides brief guidance notes. Um, but as mentioned, there is an application and portal guidance that's available on our website. So please do refer to this document if you do need any information or support on completing the, the form. Uh, we also recommend that you save your work um, regularly to minimize the risk of losing any of your work. And you can always save and return to your application form as much as you like prior to submission. Next slide, please. It's important to note that if there are team members or project partners involved, um, the lead applicant will need to invite um, them as co-applicants through the team section of the application form. So once invited, um, these partners will need to confirm their participation in the application um, by going through the My Co-Applications link. Um, and there they'll be able to select the appropriate application form and then follow the links to confirm and approve their involvement. Next slide, please. Um, so once confirmed, they'll have access to edit the form, um, and it's important to make sure that they've done all this, uh, the confirmation and approval um, in advance of the submission deadline so that you can submit your application uh, on time. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, once the application form is complete, um, it will need to be validated. And if it has been validated successfully, then you can submit the application form by clicking on the submit button and then you're done. Um, so that's pretty much how you submit the application form online using the system. Um, again, there's tons of information available on our website to support you with um, completing an application. Um, but um, I think, we have a, a bit of time now for some uh, questions. If you did have any questions around the application process or any other general questions on the program, so happy to take any of those.
Thank you very much, Brenda. Really useful. Uh, really give a, a good overview of, of how to apply to, to the programme. Um, so now we've got a, sh a short period of time before we, we put close to this session uh, for some of your questions. Um, and, and also if you've got any questions for, for Charlotte and Helen from um, the HSN. Um, so I think there was one perhaps for, for you, Charlotte, if, if that's okay. Um, uh, somebody that lives in the northeast um, and um, whether they should approach the HSN in their geographical area um, or whether they'd, they'd be better to get in touch um, with you and with your HSN on, on this particular topic area. Um, yeah, thanks. Yeah, I think, sorry, um, I put my email in the chat, hopefully that went through. And also, yeah, I think both. Um, I think it's really important to engage with your local HSN, um, but also it would be great, you know, if you are particularly interested in coming to work in the Southwest, because, we, you know, we have a um, particular programme around this, then really happy to also have a conversation. Um, so sorry, it's a double bubble for that one. Perfect. No, that's great. Thank you very much. I know it's useful. Um, we've got a question perhaps for um, you, Renda, um, on, on the sort of um, application process. Um, what is a partner in terms of the application form? Is it every single collaborative body? That's something you could answer. Yep, so a partner would be anyone who's involved in the project, um, whether that be a team member through your um, organization, so um, a member of your, um, um, in, in, like an employee, for example, um, or it could be a, a subcontractor um, or a clinical partner, for example. So any kind of individual um, who is going to be involved in the project and the delivery of the project and have a significant role um, in that delivery of the project should be listed um, as a team member and they would need to um, be listed as a co-applicant and approve and confirm their participation in the project. That's great, thank you. Um, and we've got uh, another question perhaps for the AHSN for an applicant that is based outside England. So I don't know, um, Helen or Charlotte, if you've got any recommendation for a company that is based in Cardiff on who and um, perhaps they could engage with. Hi, it's Helen here. I'd say um, con contact Yorkshire Number HSN. We'd be more than happy to speak to you and um, we can signpost you accordingly, depending on what your needs are, but um, more than happy to have a chat. Great. Thank you, Helen. Um, we also have a question about um, whether we can apply for both perinatal and autism challenges um, using different focuses of the same technology. Renda, is that something you'd be able to answer to? Yeah, sure. Um, so yeah, that's interesting if it would cover both of the challenges we've described today. Um, so in terms of um, the uh, whether or not you can apply to both, you can apply to the different challenges. However, it's important to note that they are going to be treated as two different challenges. So if you were um, recommended for funding under one challenge, um, you would be you would have to stick to that one particular challenge in terms of addressing the needs within that challenge um, instead of kind of overlapping over the two different ones because they are kind of treated as two separate uh, com like competitions in a sense. Um, so that would be important to bear in mind um, if that was um, a technology. So the recommendation would be to see which one is most applicable um, to your technology at the moment and where you kind of see um, most of the work being done and concentrating that initial feasibility work is is it going to be in focusing within that um paternity and um you know care services in maternity or is it going to be more applicable to um autism and learning disabilities and um yeah which one would be most suitable for this round of funding perfect thank you very much thank you randa um, so I think we've probably come to an end to, to, to this q and session, I'm aware of time, so um, I think it's probably time to close this session. And um, there's a couple of different messages that you can have a look at um, in the chat. Amanda posted something about um, the potential support um, and, and collaboration that um, you could have access to through Autistica, but also something from Tom in the Q&A from National Autistic Society that are also keen to support um, innovators um, in, in that space. So um, please have a look and, and get in touch with them. Um, so if we could move on to the next slide, please. Um, I just wanted to let you know that we will be holding a um, Q&A uh, drop-in clinic 
um, when you can have the opportunity to have one-to-one -one, uh, discussion with the SBRI Healthcare Programme Management Office and that's scheduled for Monday the 13th of June. So um, uh, please do, do register for, for this if you're interested. Um, as a final sort of note, the competition opened yesterday and, and will close on the 6th of July. Um, and in the meantime, if you've got any question uh, before the one-to-one the, the -one clinic um, or, or any time during this process, please do get in touch with us through our inbox. I would uh, really like to thank you, uh, thank all of our speakers today. Um, and particularly we, we had Amanda, James, um, Ned, Girish and Kelly, um, but also Helen and Charlotte for, for um, participating to, to this event uh, from the HSN uh, for joining us, but also contributing to the development of, of this competition and this session today. Uh, and we're really grateful for, for all the insightful contribution um, towards this competition. So it's so a massive thank you. And also a big thank you to the SBRI Healthcare Program Management Office for getting us to that point of, of launching this competition today. Um, and finally, thank you for all of you to uh, attend this webinar session today. Uh, we hope you found it useful and we really look forward to hearing from you. Um, so we are now uh, going to end this webinar and I hope you all have a great afternoon. Thank you for joining and I hope to speak to you soon. Bye.